Let me hear it there. Okay. So, uh, welcome again to UX Brief uh, Meetup. Uh, this is a joint event of the Saloniki UX Meetup and Athens UX uh, community. Uh, okay. I'm Ioannis Feneris. Uh, Dimitri Stathis uh, is next to me. And uh, Panagiotis Zaharias is going to uh, join us uh, in a few minutes. Um, as I said, uh, at the end, we're going to give uh, two books to, to like people of the audience. So stay with us to tell you uh, how. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, Zansin Labs from Scratch Design Studio and the UX Prodigy for supporting our events, uh, both in Saloniki UX Meetup and in Athens, uh, Athens UX Community. And of course, we want to thank uh, OK Thes for providing us uh, this uh, Zoom uh, account for this call. Uh, although we didn't uh, hit that capacity that <laughs> we aimed for, uh, but that's OK. Uh, special thanks to Dimitris Niavis, who ran all the logistics for this uh, meetup. Dimitris, thanks again. Special thanks to you. So today, uh, we are so glad to have with us Jamie Levy. Um, Jamie is, uh, you know who is Jamie, <laughs> she's, uh, she's a strategist, uh, UX or product, she will talk uh, about this uh, in a minute, uh, author of the UX strategy book, um, professor and trainer, and uh, today's topic is the evolution of uh, UX strategy. Um, after six years, if I'm not wrong, this is the second edition of uh, the UX strategy book, so Jamie we want to know why do we need to have a second edition now <laughs> at this point. Of course, we'll go, we're going to have a Q&A with uh, Jamie at the end. Uh, so bring your questions. We're going to give you gifts. And at the end of the end, we're going to um, open the microphones and uh, have a chat. We want to, th those meetups are in person, and uh, but now they are online. So we miss this networking at the end, having some beverages. So we are going to open the microphones and let's have a chat or do whatever you know meet each other uh so jamie the stage is yours i'm going to stop sharing my presentation and you can share yours okay let me get this going in the meanwhile you can uh say where are you from uh city and country it would be great to see uh okay. where so jamie Hey everybody, am I sharing screen all good? Yeah, great. Fantastic. Um, maybe I should move the, my little uh, thing with you guys uh, away from the screen. It's like the choice of getting to look at you versus my deck. So hi everybody, I'm coming at you from Berlin, Germany, where I've been hiding for the last couple of months and most of the last two years. Um, I'm so excited um, to be here for, uh, well, I'd be more excited if I was in Greece right now for a live uh, on-site meetup event, um, but I'll be coming there in July uh, to for vacation to go to Crete. Um, and then I'll, I'm hopefully gonna be coming back in October to do a workshop. Um, but I'm here now from, uh, from Germany and I, uh, a few weeks ago, my book, came out the second edition and so I'm really excited to be talking about it um, and so I'm just going to start in with the talk and uh, I look forward to your questions of the end I'm not going to be really paying attention to the chat because it'll make me very distracted so away we go so for this uh, second edition which uh, you know came out this year the first edition came out in 2015 um, I retitled um, the subhead for uh, the book. Um, it used to be called uh, UX Strategy, uh, How to Devise Innovative uh, Solutions. And now it's called Product Strategy Techniques for Devising Innovative Solutions. And so uh, most of this talk is about why I sort of pivoted on these terms and how I differentiate between them. Um, but it's also really looking at the evolution of my discovery of the term UX strategy and taking you along for the ride. So let me back it up 15 years ago when I was working at an agency called Schematic in Los Angeles, California. And I 
you know, I actually have been doing this uh, interface design, interaction design, uh, information architecture, UX design, whatever you want to call it today or in, and next week um, for, you know, since I was in my 20s, so 30 years. And I uh, went through a period of time where, you know, I was a successful dot com person. And then I went through a period of time where I, uh, you know, the bubble burst and I had to start from the bottom, um, which was actually really good for me. So when I came back up for air, I was a UX designer at Schematic, but I was already in my mid thirties with a ton of interface design and product strategy experience. And, uh, but, you know, I had to go through this whole process of learning to wireframe uh, as opposed to doing everything in my head. So I was there and really wanting to have a say in strategy. And I kept hearing about this elusive thing called the discovery phase. And all I knew was that I needed to be part of this thing um, because I would, uh, I, I just really didn't have a say in, in uh, what the product was going to be. And, and I wanted to figure out what it was. So um, what happened was I, uh, luckily, because I was a woman, it worked for me in my favor at, it, at this point, because this website project came in to redesign Oprah Winfrey's website for her television show, Oprah. And so um, they decided that they would throw me on this, on this discovery phase. So I flew out to Chicago and um, I met with the stakeholders and I had the whole team with me. Um, we had, uh, you know, people from different, uh, you know, functional groups and the count managers. And then they had like eight stakeholders there, all women, um, all bitchy women. And I was really intimidated. Um, but um, I had a, a mentor there, my friend Mark Sloan, who had done tons of discovery phase uh, workshops. And so I got to watch him lead these sessions where he did these things called concept maps. And basically they're just simple diagrams. You could see the original versions on the left of these diagrams where we had to, where we were trying to ultimately get the stakeholders on the same page, whether it was about what their, you know, what the vision was, you know, what it really meant, you know, uh, Oprah to these people, um, how to look at the content, um, really just like understanding uh, what, what the, you know, what the website needed to accomplish for, for this redesign. And so, you know, we did these exercises uh, for a couple of days and, um, and this was really great. Um, and then we came back to uh, the office in Los Angeles and they said, okay, now you need to make these personas. And I said, well, are we going to do some user research? And they're like, no, we got you covered. We have all this marketing data. Just make them off this. And I didn't know what the deal was. So I was like, okay. And so I made these bogus personas based on that. They said, okay, we need to have one who's, you know, somebody who's from the city and one who's someone from the suburbs and one who's like somebody who makes a lot of money and one who doesn't and someone who's Caucasian and someone who's the, and I'm like, my head was spinning and I couldn't figure out why we were making these weird things. Um, but I did as I was told, you know, so I, I knocked out these personas and we basically moved to uh, turning in the discovery brief after one week. And then I spent nine months um, overseeing the te team, knocking out just wireframe after wireframe while the stakeholders went back to, uh, you know, they didn't care what the brief said. They, they didn't care about what we thought about revenue streams. They didn't care about us doing any forms of user research to figure out what could, what the actual website should do to really make their users happy. Um, they just wanted to fight about the real estate and fight about the logo and fight about the colors. And so by the time this whole project, actually before it was done, I, I left. I was so disgusted because I realized this discovery phase thing um, that was also being referred to as this UX strategy phase was a complete farce. And so I decided that I really wanted to learn everything I could possibly know about UX strategy, but this is 2008 and there was a few articles about this term, 
um, or about what UX strategy was. There, you know, I knew that the discovery phase that that term was borrowed from, you know, lawyers use it when they're trying to prepare attorneys to go to, um, you know, to go to court and and gather evidence and know everything about what might happen in the trial so that they're completely prepared. So I understand that you know, what, what that was, but I had to um, really try to figure out like what was strategy and, and where it intersected. So I picked up this book by Indy Young called Mental Models and in it was this sidebar and it had this kind of Shakespearean sounding definition that I couldn't make much sense of, um, but it also had this equation and it said, experience strategy equals business strategy plus UX strategy. Now, the issue with this was that if you use deduction, it said basically UX plus business equals experience. And I really saw these terms as like, well, what's the difference between UX strategy and experience strategy? You know, what does this all mean? So it really left me with more questions than answers. So what happened was I started really looking at um, the company where Indy Young and these other founders um, worked, which was called Adaptive Path. And uh, you'll, you can see above that I went back to their website using the Wayback Machine to 2007 and 2008 to see, um, to, to give you a representation of what I was seeing at that time. Um, but they basically, you know, they were pitching their company as a company that did product experience strategy and, and experience design. And Indy Young was there and she was one of the founders. And the, so were some really other important people in the field of UX. Like they really set, um, you know, what were the deliverables and artifacts? What was the process? Um, where did it all come together? And so they had the, one of their services was experience strategy and design. And so they had it pretty clear that, you know, it, it was basically, you know, collaborative ideation with the clients here, uh, field research and ethnography and competitive analysis. So at least I, I knew that I, you know, I needed to learn like how to do a proper competitive analysis and, and how to do forms of field research. So fast forward um, several years now um, to 2016 you know, and I'm at UX week and my book has come out um, and I'm speaking there about UX strategy and I get to meet Indy Young. And so I had a really good conversation to her about the diagram. And I said, Indy, I'm really trying to understand um, what experience, what the differences between UX strategy and experience strategy, because looking at your website, it kind of seems like UX design plus business strategy equals experience strategy. And she basically told me in so many words that it was a typo. Um, so what I learned was that I wrote an entire book with the title UX strategy based on a typo. Um, but, you know, it was too late. The cat was out of the bag. There were already, um, you know, at this point, hundreds of people running around with the title experience strategist. And, and, and then at, at least 500 by the time when my, my book came out, there was three people, including me with the title UX strategist. And then it ballooned up to 500. But there were still like so many people fighting over the terminology, just like they were um, with UX, with interaction design and with uh, versus UX design and new media versus, um, you know, whatever it was called, you know, multimedia. So um, it was just really frustrating because it was just like another term that people were wasting time um, confusing whether it was recruiters, people to going to college, um, people um, who were trying to market themselves as doing, str doing strategy. Um, so I had to come to terms with that. But in my first book, how I defined UX strategy was that it's the vision of a solution that needs to be validated with real potential customers to prove that it's desired in the marketplace. And this is a, a lot of words to say basically that we have, a, we have our product vision, which is great, this idea of what you think the product should be, the business concept, in other words. Um, but 
it needs to be validated, meaning proven that there's actually customers out there that want it. And the reason for this is because you want to de-risk this value proposition um, before you release a product to market and then spend a ton of money on it and, and find out that it fails. Um, so, you know, UX strategy is really this overarching big picture, you know, this high level plan to achieve one or more business goals under conditions of uncertainty. And it's all these uncertainties that we're trying to de-risk with our strategy techniques. But what I've been finding is over the years is that this term UX strategy has evolved even further. It's taken on new meaning where it actually means more often than not that it to be strategically executing UX at a particular organization or business unit. Like we wanna evangelize the UX throughout the company, or we wanna prove the ROI of the UX, um, or we wanna have a UX playbook that says who does what. And I'm not saying that it's wrong or that it's right. It's just like a different definition because it's very focused on process. Whereas the, how I was looking at it was doing a strat strategy for a product. So for the last 12 years, I've had a Google search, a Google alert, where it's just been crawling the web um, for anyone who might use the term either UX strategy or user experience strategy. And um, it's been pretty interesting. Um, what you typically see is this, like them using it for job titles and it not having anything to do with strategy for a product or de-risking value propositions. It's like guide the UX strategy in the direction of the design sprints. That's their strategy with a small s. Or drive the UX strategy for Latin Studio through thoughtful design concepts, prototypes that sounds like process to me. Or how about this one? Uh, Chicago designers share how they measure UX design, scroll visitor recordings and more to inform a majority of its UX strategy. Or how about this one? The master class will provide concrete and practical information to help you understand UX from a holistic experience. Develop your UX strategy. Audio UX strategy will become an important part of an integral strand of audio. Oh my God, user experience strategy will incorporate UX into your business and help you create a well-established system. <sighs> we can use the latest techniques in user experience strategy, including eye tracking heat map analysis, using Fenke to identify blind spots. So all this is to say that that's not what I meant by my first book. And so that's why I've been going with the term product strategy. It just makes a lot more sense if we're talking about um, trying to you know, figure out the strategy for a product uh, before you release it to the market. And if you look at the definition here, it's basically the same definition that I had for the first book, um, which is you know, this big picture context. You know, and so the focus is very much on, you know, figuring out, you know, what the product's going to be. And then ultimately, once you do, creating a roadmap for it. So that's why I've, uh, the way I've been using it these days is that, yeah, I'm sticking with, you know, here's my UX strategy framework. But then when I talk about my techniques, I say they're product strategy techniques. Um, so let's talk about my framework for a little bit. Um, this hasn't changed from the first book to the second book. Um, the only thing that really changed uh, about the fourth one, uh, Frictionless UX, was it used to be called Killer UX, um, which I think I just had done a little bit too much surfing, was thinking about killer waves. And it really always meant to me, Killer UX meant Frictionless UX, um, so that was the only thing I changed with my framework, but let me go through these four tenets. Um, the first one is business strategy. Now, business strategy is really understanding, you know, where, let's say that you are working, you're working, whether it's at an enterprise, an agency, or a startup. Now, whatever products or services you're working on, um, you need to really understand you know, what is the goal of the company that's putting those products or services out there? 
You know, what are the, what's their business model for the products and services? What are the potential revenue streams? What is their cost structure? These are all things that um, if they sound like terms that you don't know, they're, they're not that hard to learn. And so I really wanted to um, use the book to basically give people, you know, like a cliff notes version of, of, of these um, terms, you know, using the, you know, the most, um, you know, best-selling and popular business strategy books out there. So um, these are the, this is the breakdown of a, of a business plan and of a business model. And these are the types of, you know, terms that you really want to understand. And the best way to go about it is to, I believe, is to use the business model canvas. There's a book called Business Model Generation that was written by Alex Osterwalder and Yves Pengate. And these are, it's basically um, a way to ideate very quickly, you know, with all these canvases on different concepts and plug and play different ideas and start really understanding, especially these things on the right here are very much, you know, I'm just going to say UX slash product strategy and use them interchangeably at this point, you know, understanding like who's the customer segment that you're targeting. Um, you know, and, and figuring out like, do you have two customer segments? If it's a two-sided marketplace, like for instance, Airbnb, where you have hosts and you have um, guests, the people who are subletting the rooms and the people who are renting the rooms or the, or the flats. Um, understanding the relationship to the segments. Um, you know, is it going to be, uh, you know, are you marketing at them through, um, through online social channels like Facebook or are you, um, are, you know, do you need to have, you know, be able to reach them through, uh, to have a customer service on the phone? Um, understanding really what is the value prop of the business, understanding the different revenue streams for monetizing the customers. Um, those are very much baked into the product strategy and to be, you know, to, to move up, you know, from you product design, UX design into a more a leadership role, you really want to understand this vernacular because this is how the stakeholders talk to each other. Um, now, these things on the left, um, they can be a bit more elusive to understand. And they're, they're, when you're doing these types of canvases, that's, this is where you want to bring in um, people from the business side to help you understand the partners and the activities, the resources and the cost structure. Now I break this down in my book, but there's plenty of information on, on the internet about these things. And I highly recommend, you know, if you, if you aren't familiar with business models, starting with this canvas or starting with Ash Maria's lean canvas, they're almost identical. I, I compare them side by side and talk about the distinctions, um, but the lean canvas is a bit more friendly um, because, uh, you know, it's geared more for startups and, you know, you start what the numbering is basically where you start with these things, you know, you're going to figure out the segments first and then what's the problem that you want to solve, you know, what's the unique value prop and so on. So really getting your head around, um, you know, and using the canvases as a crutch and also as a way to build consensus on um, the product vision um, is a really great way to get started in understanding uh, business strategy and how it intersects with UX design to become product strategy. Now, to really understand um, the strategy of the products, I think the most important thing to do is to really know how to do competitive research. So I have two chapters dedicated to this from the first book and in the second one, and I've only fine tuned these techniques, um, both for conducting research and for doing the analysis of the competitors. And it's very labor intensive. Um, you know, you can work, um, it, I, I have a, a toolkit. You can go to uh, jamielevy.com or userexperiencestrategy.com and download the free toolkit that has this competitive um, uh, you know, research uh, matrix, um, but it's really about understanding, you know, how to figure out like who's a competitor and an indirect competitor, learning about nascent markets, learning about um, and looking at everything, not just saying, oh, their website's really nice or not so nice, but understanding the different things like revenue streams and where they're getting their traffic and how they market themselves on social networks. All of these things are really important when you're trying to compare competitors um, 
you know, uh, side by side. And then once you've done the competitive research, then you want to do a SWOT analysis um, on each of the competitors from their perspective and then do an aggregated analysis so that you can do um, then output something like a findings brief, which I explain in detail also in the book with um, much cleaner examples that I've been basically calibrating over the last five years um, by, you know, because I've been doing workshops over, all over the world and really um, trying to figure out like, what's the best way to present all this data? Um, so that's what this, you know, where business strategy comes into play. So this next tenant is called value innovation. And this term I got from the book, Blue Ocean Strategy, um, where they talk about value innovation basically being about like lowering the cost either of, you know, for the buyer by lowering the cost structure of the business or figuring out a way to create the products and services so they cost less money, um, but also increasing the value. Um, now, as far as um, how this really fits in with the product design, to me, it's about minimalism and really focusing on what is the primary utility of the product and moving away from having tons of features and creating and focusing on the key features that really make it an indispensable part um, of somebody's life. So what they did was basically took M Michael Porter's um, you know, two ways to have a competitive advantage, which was differentiation and lower costs and mash them together. So the way I look at it, when you transpose it into the digital world, because things aren't quite the same, you know, in digital as they are with um, traditional business strategy, you know, it's just, you know, uh, there's so many products that are free to users. So all of a sudden you have these revenue streams um, that, uh, you know, that look at monetization in, in new ways. And so to me, what it came down to was, going back to Indy's book, Mental Model, um, and really understanding, you know, what is the mental model that um, a customer slash user has when they come to your product? And what is it going to take to have them experience the aha moment of your value proposition through your digital interface? And so often it's like thinking about the experience in the offline world. Like if we think of hitchhiking, if we go back in time, to when most of you guys were little kids. Um, but like, uh, I don't know about you, but hitchhiking was a very dangerous thing. You didn't want to get into a stranger's car, nor did you want to let them into your car. Um, bad things could happen, um, especially if you're a woman. But now, um, you know, you use a, a product like Uber and it's no big deal. All of a sudden you're getting into strangers' cars or if you're an Uber or Lyft or any of these other uh, ride hailing uh, platforms, you're letting people into your car all the time. And the mental model has completely shift, shifted. And so when you see these shifts in these mental models, then you see you know, what people basically call disruptive innovation because people are changing the way that they look at um, accomplishing a goal in a major way. So another thing, another tenant is validated user research. Um, now, how this is different than just traditional user research is it's got that word validated in front of it. And this term um, was really popularized when Eric Ries put out uh, Lean Startup and uh, people started adopting all these different lean uh, ways to conduct experiments to learn about validating hypotheses and that the goal was to have measurable results. So I riffed on this with my book and said, well, how can we do some form of systematic way of building a product that's focused on the value prop um, and then testing it to see if um, it would um, deliver on, on something that people would like, but not building anything at all. Um, so here we're looking at a storyboard that was actually, uh, uh, <laughs> um, this was by Demetrius, who is how I come to you now, because I uh, was looking for someone who could draw really well, and he could. Um, so he helped with this fantastic storyboard. 
Um, but basically, if you read through it, you'll see that um, it's just uh, simple images that start with the problem. Jen needed to get to work because traffic of, and she'll be late and ends with the solution. Jen makes it to work on time. So we basically bookmark these, you know, bookend these two things and then say, OK, what are the key features that are going to make this work and and deliver on this value proposition? Now, a lot of people use storyboards for all kinds of different forms. I mean, obviously, they're they're used in film and they're used in commercials. They're used for so many different things. But when they're used for product design, um, they tend to be, uh, you know, focused a bit more toward usability. And I'm bending everything to focus more on value propositions and business models. And so when you see these things, you're, you know, what we're looking at are really the screens that make a difference so that we can use the storyboards for building consensus with the team. These are not a deliverable um, before we move into rapid prototyping. So here you see just a hand-drawn version that can be done in, you know, under 30 minutes that gets the concept across. And then here we see one that's more mocked up using, you know, higher fidelity images um, that also does the same job, but could be, you know, put in front of a client potentially um, so that they can walk through it. And knocking out a bunch of storyboards is far more lean, far more iterative, um, the potential to be iterative because it is lightweight. Um, and it really forces you to say, OK, what can I do with six panels? And it's not about the number six, just like doing uh, user research isn't about the number five. It's about giving yourself some kind of limit so that you're saying, OK, you know, what is the you know, least amount that I, I can do here that will get the story across? And so you're starting out really building your narrative with, with the captions. And so here, like you could see in caption, uh, five that you know we're, I'm just showing a, a text message um, to get through the screens here, but the the point is to show that you know some things are going to happen inside of the app or on the website, and some things are just going to happen with notifications because they're really an intrinsic part of um, the customer experience and the user experience design. So once you have storyboards. Um, or basic script, that's when you can move into rapid prototyping because you basically have your starting point and your ending point. And I you know, highly recommend tools like Figma and Adobe XD to just knock out prototypes quickly using their toolkits um, to, you know, and using screen grabs to get things as fast as possible, but truly focusing on the key features, not spending time reinventing design. Like here, I'm just grabbing on the left uh, a screen from, you know, the Apple bar when I want to book appointments to take my computer in for work. Um, and, you know, and then on the right, I'm showing, you know, basically the, the prices so I could get feedback on you know, when, when they see the cost of, of doing a wedding through the platform versus um, doing it, you know, with the uh, current solutions that it would be actually so much less, but I needed to have a screen in here that so they once they got through the aha moment, they could really then get to this point and see the breakdown of how much it would cost for them. Um, and then once you have the product, it's, um, I get into um, conducting online uh, qualitative user research. Now, the first book was focused on doing it in the field, um, but because I wrote the book um, during the pandemic, um, I really needed to pivot hard and figure out, well, can online research be conducted in a methodical way where we can get measurable results? So I created more tools for my toolkit, which includes this um, user research spreadsheet where you basically pop in the different uh, people who are going to be interviewed and have this quick way for taking uh, to take notes into so that you can do a comparison across the different um, participants um, so that you can do an analysis quickly. So here we're looking at a rapid prototype in the bottom right. We're looking at here we're actually seeing um, Nico, who's conducting uh, the study, and then we see his spreadsheet set up on the left side there. Um, and then at the very end, trying to figure out, like, how can I present the results to the stakeholders so that they're meaningful and, and really coming up with, like, 
what did I learn? And we're not talking about usability. It doesn't really matter if somebody can use your product if they don't want it to begin with. So it's extremely important that the questions be geared toward do they like the key feature and is it important to them that would you know, make it actually be a key feature? Um, do they understand the overall value proposition? Is it something they would use? Um, would they pay for it at the price that you cite there? Or would there be some other possible business model? Um, but trying to present the, uh, the data in a way so it's, you know, has these like validation baked into it and percentages is the big idea. Now, another technique, this is the ninth chapter in the book I talk about are basically uh, conducting um, qu quantitative online user research. Now, most people don't call it that, but basically uh, they call it doing landing page experiments, doing online advertising experiments, or even they, they get called doing smoke tests. So now we're looking at a smoke test done by Volkswagen. Um, they uh, have this big initiative called um, We Share, where the big idea before COVID was that you could, you know, buy a, a, a Volkswagen or Falvey if you're here, and you um, uh, would be able to have everything from like your <laughs> dry cleaning delivered to your car that you could just like leave the car parked on the street and put it in share mode and someone else could use it. They had all these big ideas um, before COVID. And one of them was that there would be this built-in app, you know, in the car um, so that people could actually get car washes, that it was part of the cost of, uh, let's say, buying the car. It was part of a package. And so they wanted to test out like who would be interested in car wash? Would it be people in the city? Would it be people in the rural areas? And so that's what they really wanted to learn. So they created this landing page. I mean, as you can see, it says nothing about Volkswagen on it. They basically put it up at a, a URL and it, and, it, and it doesn't really matter for you to know what it says in German. But what you can see is that they're very, very simple. Um, they have, you know, the most important thing is the call to action um, because you're trying to get people to click on it so you can really test um, the conversion and see if people were interested in the app. And so what they do is they, you run and advertise a, an online ad at it. You could use Google um, search terms or you can use, um, you know, the dreaded Facebook um, but Facebook, you know, for better or worse, mostly worse, is really great at micro-targeting. And so with micro-targeting, you can run these ads and run them in a very specific time period, run them at a very specific customer segment, i.e. rural part of Germany versus a city in Germany, and then get back results like this in a very short period of time with very little money. In fact, I have my uh, students at the University of Southern California Every semester I teach the class, I have them run experiments where they spend five to $10 on an ad campaign. Um, and we usually see with the spread like some results and then we can just keep iterating until we get there. Um, but the big idea is that you're looking at what we see circled in red there is the conversions. You know, and you could see from looking at the, on the, in the right column that, um, you know, they had much higher conversion um, with the one that was running um, at a rural region versus the city. And so, um, and this is the way it was presented. And the reason it was really important to me to have, um, to have this case study in my book, because the first book really focused on startups that I'd worked with was uh, two reasons. One was I needed, it was important for me to, but the book was more focused on enterprise versus startup because there's so many more people that work in enterprise um, than startups. Um, so that was really big. So I wanted to show like, hey, there's this company called Volkswagen, probably heard of them, right? Um, that are conducting experiments. Um, so it might be okay for you. Um, and then on top of that, um, I wanted the book to be more global. So I was really excited um, to, to be able to document their process for the book. So that brings us to the fourth tenet, which is frictionless UX. Now, um, 
all my techniques are pretty much focused on the first three tenets and frictionless UX is baked into all of them. You know, it's like, we want to create a product that people can figure out um, by looking at it. You know, that's the goal is we don't want them struggling on that. Sure, we can put onboarding hints, but the more we do that, we're just introducing more friction between the user slash customer trying to accomplish their goal. Now, designing um, frictionless UIs has become quite popular. In fact, they have, you know, it's part of what they call growth hacking. Um, now there's another movement called growth design. If you read uh, Nir Yell's book, Hooked, um, he's got another model around it, but it's really this idea of understanding, you know, what are the points where people could potentially, the touch points throughout your product, including the first time the user even hears of the thing, um, to get them to come in from the top of the funnel and then through all the different touch points and then come out at the bottom, you know, either a paying customer um, or a happy customer that you can monetize in other ways. So I'd like to end this um, with this quote, which is how I actually start the book and tell you why I chose this quote. Um, and it's from a, a very famous poem called The Road Not Taken. Um, by Robert Frost. Um, and he basically talks about, you know, taking the road less traveled. Now, I think if you want to be a strategist, you know, you have to be open to taking the road less traveled because it really requires that you're, um, you know, open to taking risks, that you're open to, to conducting experiments and having them fail that you're open to presenting your failures to your boss or your client and saying, hey, this is what I learned and this is how I'm going to um, you know, set up the next experiment. Or I learned this and now I think we should potentially pivot on the value proposition. Um, but it really requires if you're going to move into strategy um, that you're open you know, to this idea of failure. Because um, it's not really failure if you learn something. You know, this idea that you, um, you know, you could potentially, um, you know, oh, uh, I, I, I don't want to show it too soon because, you know, people won't really get it. Um, you know, we really need to um, move away from this and, and figure out, like, how can we get uh, our product concept in front of the stakeholders and in front of customers as soon as possible so that we can learn um, do they even want this thing? Um, be open to the idea that there's not just one good idea, that you, we should have be exploring multiple ideas and then potentially, you know, cherry pick the best ofs from these different ideas. Um, and then as far as your career goes, it's like not just being complacent and staying at one job forever unless you're constantly learning. You know, every year that goes by in your career is a year that you should be growing. Um, and I say that now as someone who's 55 years old, you know, when I decided to actually before I decided on my second book, I was sitting at a cafe with a friend and I was just like, oh, you know, yeah, the first book was a bestseller and I don't think I can do that with another book and I don't want to have a second book fail and, you know, when and, you know, like, oh, I don't know, you know, what I should do, what, what's going to happen if I fail and he's just like, well, if you do nothing, isn't that far worse? You know, you'll just never know, you know? And, and, and I realized that, that he was right, you know, and, and that this goes, you know, this affects our life, you know, this, you know, fear of taking risk, you know, it's, it, it can so easily prevent us from really, you know, exploring the world. And so that's why that quote is there. Anyhow, I'm not gonna try to say this word, but thank you so much. And I'm excited to hear your questions. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, very insightful. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of questions, uh, uh, we have a, a lot of questions, but more of them are going to, uh, to be thrown here. Um, OK, first, let me say that uh, Panagiotis is with us. Also, Dimitris and another, the other Dimitris are with us. Uh, we are sorry for that uh, 100 uh, limit uh, technical issue. We are going to give the record, uh, of course, uh, in a few weeks. So that's the plan B. Uh, 
so we are 100 people. Let's uh, start the Q&A. Uh, anyone that wants to ask anything, uh, please uh, raise your hand in order to call you to ask directly your question. Until that point, I'm going to read the questions from uh, the chat. And uh, I tried to, ma to make some, th some themes of the questions. So let's talk about, uh, about today and the next years. Uh, Radu uh, is asking, what do you see UX strategy in five years time? What would you say would be the main changes? <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm right, I'm right now in the present. You know, like who cares about five years? What are you doing about it now? You know, like, why does that matter? You know, like, I, I don't I don't really understand. Um, let's talk about now, you know, it's like what, what I wanna hear from what, what people are doing uh, that's strategic at, at their current, in their current positions and, and what's working and what's not working. Okay, great. That's a great pass for my question. So let's talk about now. Why do we still need to talk about working in iterations and uh, what's out the assumptions and uh, validate the hypothesis? Isn't this the default way? Why do we still need to uh, promote that this would be a great <laughs> way? <laughs> and I'm talking about now, not five years. In yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, five years from now, the whole world could blow up at the rate we're going. So <laughs> uh, let's talk about now, guys. I mean, didn't we just go through some terrible shit? Um, you know, so... Um, because they just haven't been adopted, you know, worldwide, you know, I have a client in California that's still like pretending that they're agile when they're waterfall, you know, um, that still like says, oh, we're, we're going to focus on these really important features. And then they go ahead and validate them. And then they go ahead and, and knock out, you know, a Miro board and, and uh, a roadmap, and then they hand it off to dev. And then the, and the developers like, say, oh, this is going to take too much time. We're going to get rid of a bunch of features without even validating, you know, that, hey, this is the right thing to do. Um, there's just so many uh, opportunities um, for things to get messed up, um, especially in large enterprises. And so why we're still talking about, uh, you know, yeah, I think UX people are, are, are more aware of lean startup um, because it just made UX design so much more important. So we're all, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, um, but these corporations and the lean, and the startups are more often than not, but the corporations, <laughs> it's a big shift for them to, to approach this. And that's why we hear even bigger terms like digital transformation, because you can't have experiments run at a corporation where they're not open to running them. And it takes this like culture of innovation or whatever the hell they wanna call it, where it's like this open mindset for saying, okay, we're not going to have this total hierarchical structure of, you know, here's the PM man. And then here's the, the, other, the boss man and these other people, you know, that you have to have this like collaborative, more flat, um, you, know, you know, lack of hierarchy. And so I think, that's why we're not seeing it adopted is because we just have these companies that move very slowly where we have these you know stakeholders who are just like i don't want to i don't want to give away you know any any you know i don't want to like have anyone telling me what the strategy could be i want to do it and so the most common question i get is how can i be strategic when my boss won't let me and it really has to be about you know, at a certain point where you take the initiative, where you are like, I'm going to be intrapreneurial. I'm not going to wait for them to tell me I, I can do a competitive analysis. I'm going to do it anyway, even if I have to do it at night or on the weekends, or I'm not going to wait for them to tell me I'm going to run my user research as an experiment. I'm going to do it anyway. And then I'm going to present it them and say, hey, what do you think? You know, like when you present this evidence in this way, it's harder for them to argue with you when you present in such a way like here. Um, so 90% of people said that they would never use this product and here's their names. I don't know what to think. What do you think? Oh, you think that, that maybe we should go in a different direction? I, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. And then all of a sudden they're saying what you thought, but it's coming out of their mouth. So you still get what you want and they don't feel like, oh, you told them what to do. It was their idea. You just brainwashed them to think that. And I feel like that's kind of the only way to start building trust and let them run with it. 
But then they all of a sudden get this like, oh, wow, that person is actually going to be really helpful to me. I'm going to have them do it again and again and again. So it's really about, you know, taking initiative and building trust um, if you want to run experiments and if you want to do strategy. Okay, great. And I think that uh, you answered Panagiotis question. Panagiotis is the organizer of the Athens uh, UX community meetup. Uh, he asks, how can we convince business people to really understand the value of UX work? Any simple tips? You gave the greatest tip, which I'm going to print a, a t-shirt. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway. And that's the, uh, the data. But any other tips, any, any tips on, uh, from your experience on how can business people see like our world and get the value, the return of investment of the UX work? Yeah. Um, so are you asking about, why are you asking me about how they get the work of <laughs> you know, UX? It's a typical question uh, of one uh, <laughs> UXer to another. Uh, how did you convince your stakeholders? <laughs> you know, your, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm just being honest. It's like every single company is different. You know, it's like, I'm not going to pretend I know the answer to that because, you know, it's like, I, I believe obviously that evidence, you know, you need, and that's why you need to run things as experiments that you need to, you know, do these, you know, present it to them. So it looks like, oh, wow, you have a findings brief. Oh, wow, you have a user research brief. Not be doing competitive research in a Google doc with a bunch of screen grabs and saying, oh, here, I did a competitive research of the bunch of apps. And this is what I think. Like if you're not talking their language of business models, then to them, you're just like a, a wireframe monkey, you know, and that's what it really, you know, a lot of people tend to blame everyone else for their problems. And I feel like you need to try everything. I mean, this is how it worked for me. Try everything that you can conceivably possible to do product strategy and then put the evidence in front of them. And then by the second time, if they ignore you, go get another job you know, because you're just wasting your time and being frustrated or accept that that's your reality and do that for them and try to do product strategy on the side until you have enough confidence to, to, you know, go get another job, you know, but people, I promise you, do not come up to you at your desk and say, Hey, can you do some strategy? No, they want, they want more prototypes and, and wireframes and this kind of stuff out of designers. That's what they, you know, that's what they hire. That's what they hire those roles for. So you really need to take initiative and, and be okay with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, I'm going this to an expected area. Let's talk about UX and product. Uh, <laughs> and the first, the first question is my question. You have uh, mentioned the answer of this question uh, both today and in your book. And But I want to ask this uh, and uh, broadcast it to to the audience if you could you could uh wrote you, you you let's say we are in a parallel universe and you write the first edition today would the title be ux strategy or would it be product strategy or would you consider to be product strategy okay um it would be exactly what it is ux strategy because that was the title that people really, you know, if I call it product strategy at that time, as I say with that book, product strategy was something that wasn't necessarily associated with digital products. Like I searched LinkedIn. I mean, I'm like a LinkedIn freak, you know, like at that time, how many people call themselves product strategists? And there, it just wasn't a common title in digital because mostly product strategy is owned by the product manager, by the product owner. And so product strategy is something done by them. And as soon as the designers start doing it, then they're like, hey, you're in my, you know, my sandbox, get the hell out. Um, so I stuck with UX strategy because actually it was called user experience strategy and O'Reilly smartly said, make it short. Um, so they made it UX strategy. And I wanted a book that was UX for the product designers, which were called UX designers back then. And uh, the strategy for all the entrepreneurs and for the UX people that wanted to learn about strategy. And, and that was it, you know, fast forward years later and all of a sudden UX designers are called product designers. So it made sense to then say, okay, it's product strategy. Just kidding, <laughs> I'm going with that guys and I'm gonna use them interchangeably until the other UX strategy can go away. Um, but, you know, these terms are just gonna, we just kind of got to roll with it, you know, like I was like, am I going to really go through my book and 
and cross them out. And, and, and I was like, nah, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous. You know, I, it's too hard, you know, product slash UX is basically to us the same thing. Great. So another question of, uh, that I have about for about five years, and you are the one that I have to ask. Do you think that the product manager, the digital product manager role is the correct role for containing the, the strategy uh, thread? Or do we need to separate those roles? It's a different to do uh, strategy and, and it's different to do management of the product. Do you think that uh, the product management role is okay? Or do you think that we have an inflation there? Yeah, I, I think it's just as conflated as... Uh... UX designers who want to be strategic. It's just one of those things, strategy, come on. Most people want at a certain point to be to have a say in the product, to have a seat at the strategy table, whether that be a manager or a designer. You know, a lot of people, you know, and marketing people. So strategy is like this yummy, yummy, you know, candy to people who are trying to advance their careers. And managing a bunch of people isn't necessarily fun after a long time. So product managers definitely want to have a say in strategy and be doing product roadmaps. And so like, for instance, this client I had worked with yesterday on their process, um, you know, they had this mirror board where they had all the things a product strategist does and all the things their product managers do. And then all these things, you know, that you extend. And I'm like, wait a minute, these things for the product manager and these things for the product strategist do you actually have people with these two titles? And he's like, no, well, we, we aspire to, you know? So I, I think at this point, it's, it's hard to say, if I had to bet, I would say that there's going to be way more product strategists, um, you know, which is why, you know, I'm moving in that direction, why I call myself that, you know, I think it's about time, you know, the UX strategy, you know, as we saw from all those Google alerts, it really just means process. You know, like let Jared Spool have that lane and call and because it is a whole field into itself. If you want to focus on optimizing process, there's lots of opportunity to do that. Um, but if your heart is in product like me, then, you know, it just makes sense to put the word strategy and it. And I can't say that um, it should just be ours. I think we need to share it with the whole team. And that when we do these, uh, you know, competitive research and user research, that it should be the whole team is involved. Thank you very much. Uh, Dimitris Niavis, do you want to open your microphone and ask directly, Jamie? And uh, until that point, uh, Dana is asking, how can UX strategies differ from the typical UX designers? So how would you say that, what is the difference, the main difference between a UX designer and the UX strategist? Uh, I don't know. Look on LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. It's like, what am I, a dictionary? Like, really? <laughs> I, I think that you, we are looking at uh, you as a dictionary right now. <laughs> I mean, I guess <laughs> if, what is a UX designer? A UX designer, you know, do they knock out wireframes or are they doing visual design? Like, everywhere you go, they're doing, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, you're doing fantastic. You know, it's just like, I get these questions all the time and it's like, there's no, we look at the job descriptions, they're different, you know, some of them just copy paste the same ones and some of them say, okay, I want to hire one, someone who's full, a UX designer who's full stack, you know, so we can't, you know, all I can say is like, if you're doing design, you tend to be doing design artifacts, you know. Um, and less user research in some places. So then you, all of a sudden you have to differentiate and have a user research role. If you're doing, if you want to do strategy, there still are very few role, few roles for product strategists. You tend to get them from when you're already in there and say, I want to do product strategy and then start saying, okay, I want this new title to go along with it. You're not going to go walk in somewhere in most cases and get a product strategy job. It's more likely that you're going to get a product owner job where you get to do product strategy. And there's like no freelance product strategy jobs because they want that work done inside of whether it be the startup or the enterprise. So, you know, I think it's important to focus on the techniques of doing product strategy and less so on these titles because they're, they, they're, they're too overlapping and, and they're meaningless. But the things that aren't meaningless are what is competitive research? 
what is validated user research, what is storyboarding, what is rapid prototyping. These are all things that are totally accomplishable that you can take with you as you apply for these jobs. Um, and then when you do look at them, when you're applying for a UX strategy job, is it the process kind? And are you gonna be cool with that? Because we saw what those jobs are, there's tons of them. Or is it one that's focused on product or is it both? Say what? Sorry, I'm mute, Dimitris. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, Jamie, for the presentation. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get all the people in to hear you, but I'm happy that we record this. Um, so my question would be, since it seems that we live in an age that uh, everybody jumps from one job description to the next hot thing uh, in the UX world, how would you suggest that we deal with uh, uh, UX tragedists, people that pose as, as strategists that mess up the whole UX process and the whole product development uh, how, how would you suggest that we, that the practitioners that face these people deal with them? Great. How do we deal with the UX strategists? I'm sorry. Tragedists, not the strategists, not the people that, that actually know what they're doing, but people <laughs> posing as, as strategists, which lead to actually UX or product tragedies, right? Because. Right. So the question is, how do we deal with strategy posers? Yeah, you could say that. With evidence, you know, it's it's just it just comes down to I, I feel like the you know it it just comes down to being able to show them with something that you're that you're on the right track versus arguing with them. Um it, it, I, I mean I don't like it. I don't like my answer either. You know, I would much rather just like go up to them and say, look, dude, I have 30 years experience and I know how to do blah, blah, blah. But it's not going to win anything. They're just going to say I'm I'm a jerk off, you know. So I got to go in saying, wow, I, you know, I think I'm not saying like go, go in and gaslight these people, but you want to go in and say, hey, I respect. I really respect the work that you're doing and I'm really excited to work with you on this project. And I just wanna be careful not to ever step on your toes. Do you think um, we could have a, you know, a brief meeting um, to just talk about um, the different artifacts that I'd like to work on and then show them examples of some of them, you know, some of the work you've done and then say, would you like to work with me on this? And they may just be thinking, oh, well, you know, see if they react like, you know, like a, a, a crazy dog and just be like, no, no, you shouldn't be doing that. And then you'll get that vibe sooner than later or see if they're interested in collaborating with you. Um, but you definitely need to be, um, you know, like what is there, you know, you, you just can't, you have to avoid being antagonistic and figure out like, what is their, what is making them say that? Is it because they're trying to cover their ass and not take risk? Is it because they come from another company where they think they know everything and what did, you know, you can look at their LinkedIn profile and figure out where, you know, what, what, you know, what is driving them? Are they working 50 hours a week? Are they trying to avoid working 50 hours a week? It's really understanding their motivation and then just like honing in on that and figuring out like, okay, you know, so, you know, their issue might be that they're afraid to like say that they're going to miss a deadline. So you need to figure out like, well, if I'm going to tell them to do something that's going to deviate from the roadmap, I need to be sensitive to the roadmap and show them that you're not just like, you know, got this big idea without coming in with an alternative plan. You know, I think that's a, a big thing. Strategy. So don't antagonize them. Uh, understand what their their motivation or their the fears are, and yeah. then work with that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank uh, you, James. I'm trying to uh, catch all the questions. Uh, okay, let's try to answer them all. So. Uh, Two questions in one. Angeliki is asking, according to your experience, what is the profile of successful UX strategies? What is their background in terms of discipline, experience, and education? Nikos is asking, how would you find an, a clean or an effective process of hiring and onboarding a strategy? So let's talk about strategists. 
what are their background, disciplines, experience, and how do you hire uh, and onboarding strategies? Let's make it one question if you. Hmm. It's interesting. That's a, that question I do like, because that is something that's evolving. When I wrote the first book, I had five interviews with different strategists. And with all of them, I asked them if they thought that you needed an MBA to do strategy, and all of them said no. Um, and most of that uh, was informed by the fact that, like me, they learned it on their own. Um, but that, that, you know, the world has changed quite a bit where you can now get an MBA online. And there's going to be definitely um, an advantage to um, having, you know, if you're still in college or looking at a master's degree, if you're already really great at design to taking, you know, getting, getting you know, an, an online certificate, you know, and taking some business classes. I don't think you need the degree if you can be self-motivated and read a ton of business books or listen, like I don't read very well, but I listen really well to books at least. And, um, you know, so all, 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 most of the business books, you know, I listened to while hiking and that was, it made all the difference. You know, it's kind of like how I'm learning German. It's through immersion. And the, they, 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 these books like make no sense the first time you go through them. But again, it's just like learning a vocabulary and being able to use that language and whether you have to put yourself through a degree or a certificate program, or you can just like learn, learn that language by reading the books on your own. That's an important ingredient, you know, is to beef up your business strategy side to understand online marketing. You know, when I worked at an agency, when I worked in the agency back in the day, um, <laughs> it's like this old lady. Uh, um, I, we used to always hate the marketing people. We'd be like, uh, you know, God, why don't they shut up? All they talk about is SEO, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, now, you know, with growth hacking and, and, and guerrilla marketing and all and running experiments and integrating social media, it's so much fun. Um, and you really just got to get your, just like embrace it. If you're going to do this stuff, it, you need to know funnels. You need to know all these different uh, products out there, whether it be KISS metrics to Google analytics and be like, yeah, I've run a few experiments and here's my conversion results. And I've run online advertising campaigns and here's what happened, you know? So if you are at a job, that's not going to let you do it then start taking some freelance projects that's going to let you do that, even if it pays you a euro an hour, you know, I feel like a lot of people say, oh, I'm not going to go on to Upwork or freelance or whatever it is because that, you know, you're competing against people uh, lowballing. I say better to make a dollar an hour than to spend $10,000 on a class, right? Because then you have the professional experience and you've done some client work, even if they paid you a dollar or a euro. So I think any opportunity to, um, to, to really, uh, you just can't, you know, the only way to do it is through hands-on experience. The only way to learn strategy is the same way that you learn design, which is by practice and getting good at it and building up your confidence. And with strategy, it's again, the same thing. That's the educational part. I mean, you could, oh, that's a perfect pivot to talk about my master classes. Hey guys, can I share something? <laughs> Great assist. <laughs> Um, here, check this out, guys. Uh, so I have these uh, online master classes, and they're the master classes are already sold out, but the guests, but the lectures are not. And I'll put it in the chat. And the deal is, is that it's six hundred dollars, except it's not for you, because it's six hundred dollars, right, for everyone who already paid for it. So we can't tell everybody about it. But there's six lectures. They start on the 25th and they're recorded and you can watch the recording up until the next week. And I'll be teaching principles and benefits of uh, UX strategy, the problem space, you know, conducting uh, interviews, you know, going through basically the whole book with my latest and greatest lectures from two different universities I teach at. Um, and then you'll get your fill of product strategy. And if you use the code, um guess what it is anyone got a guess Greece check this out apply ta-da it's 150 bucks okay for six lectures so um act now 
uh, and I'll post it into the chat, um, but that's, that's the deal, um, is if you wanna learn, I'll post this in the chat. Um, and they're an event, right? So you could type in UX strategy, Jamie Levy, and you'll find the lectures only. Um, so yeah, sign up for my lectures. They start on the 25th, there'll be six of them and uh, I'll teach you everything I know. Uh, what's the second part of your question? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this. This is so awesome. Uh, the second part of the question, I missed that, but, but I'm going to uh, <laughs> use your assist about marketing because Grant is asking, how does UX strategy intersect with brand strategy? Are these complement complementary disciplines, the brand strategy and the UX strategy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, let's see, I'm gonna put it, into the Eventbrite for anyone that wants to jump on the Eventbrite, uh, on the lecture, join the lectures. Just remember to use Greece, the discount. Um, okay, so brand strategy is really, uh, I, I think it's part of product strategy, you know, and the brand strategy typically, if we're talking about related to the product, it, it it's like we're talking about like, you know, we could be talking about something that's as, uh, more on the visual design side, like the, you know, like the logos and the colors and the font and the messaging, or it can be more around, you know, the, the content strategy, you know, what is our brand? If we think about like how they talk to you on products like TaskRabbit or, you know, SurveyMonkey, you know, like the onboarding, the cleverness, um, you know, that's part of their brand when we think of Apple and their brand and, and how it's so baked into their products you know, it, it's really, you know, it's really part of it. But the, to me, the brand is meaningless if the product or service is garbage. Um, and so people can get so uh, hopped up on, you know, what is our brand? How do we come off as cool when they should really be focused on what their value proposition is? So I feel like it's a, a later subset of product strategy that should be on the roadmap figuring out the branding, but that it's something that's uh, in most cases, you know, if we're not talking about like a band or, you know, something that, you know, you know, a product that is completely like useless, except for its brand, um, you know, that, that people pay for because of its brand, but otherwise it's just like as good as something else. Um, you know, it's just, uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, secondary to, to figuring out what the business strategy is first. I'm happy to hear a debate though, if you got a better answer. Oh, <laughs> okay. I think not now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, do you have, uh, we are okay to do another one or two questions? Are we okay? Sure. Yeah. We have passed uh, one hour, one and a half. Okay, uh, I'm not going yeah, to- Yeah, uh, Oh, yeah? Can I take one, please? Ah, Panagetis, of course. Okay, okay. welcome. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much, Jamie, for being here with us. Uh, I'm Panagiotis. I'm the organizer of Athens UX community, the, uh, one of the communities that are, uh, are together for this joint uh, meetup. Uh, really uh, want to be excused for missing the very first part of your talk, but I had already told the guys I had to go to the vaccination center and, uh, I, you know, I took, uh, I took the shot. Awesome. Well, and that's I'm an awesome excuse. I'm happy for you. That's great. And I'm feeling fine. Yes, yes. Good for you. Uh, I wanted to, to ask you, uh, uh, I know that uh, it seems that you, you don't like too much uh, customer journey mapping as a method. Could you please comment on that? Um. <laughs> oh, did you watch that my, my most popular video just because it has the word <laughs> I hate on journey maps um yeah. my issue I, I think it, journey... it is important for everybody to hear your sure your... so yeah. first of all I, I, Jim Kalbeck is is a friend of mine and I love his book and I think when you have substantial user research then journey maps are really important for figuring out customer touch points I think when you're talking about customer experience versus uh, product strategy, and I'm not getting into that terminology because um, that's a whole nother talk. Um, 
you know, these journey maps are absolutely crucial. Um, but when we're talking about uh, digital products, um, digital services, where no user research has been done, we're focused on the, you know, the discovery phase, then what are we mapping out in the journey map? We're just spending a lot of time making a circuitous map that nobody's gonna look at. You can put it up in the bathroom wall. Um, I'm just really trying to come up with techniques that move away from diagramming that are time consuming, that nobody really wants to decipher and into the world of spreadsheets that are just like design free, you know, and findings briefs that are just design free, simple, clear, concise, um, and being real about what you're trying to convince people of. Um, that's my answer to that. I guess I hate on them when they're because most of them are bullshit. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I got this. Do you have a follow up question here? No, no, no. It's okay. Thanks. Okay. But, you know, I just uh, wanted to hear Jamie uh, talking about this uh, quite important issue, I think. Yeah. Great topic. Okay, uh, I'm not going to catch all the questions. So, uh, excuse me for that. I'm going to give you one more question. Uh, Effie is asking, how do you get the product teams to get their heads out of their immediate here and now reactive testing to get things out of the door and get more into strategy? Okay, I'm reading this wrong. Let me do it again. How do you get product teams to get their heads out of the immediate here and now? Reactive testing to get things out of the door and more into strategic long-term thinking. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. I mean, I, I deal with that with clients all the time. Like we'll be doing strategy and doing workshops. And then all of a sudden comes, oh, we have to launch and they're, it's gone. It's like that moment has passed because all of a sudden their head's down trying to get a product out the door. And so, you know, there's no easy answer. Like I almost want to tell sometimes the client, like, let's just get a team that's focused on innovation. You know, like this is what works at Volkswagen is they have an innovation studio whatever, you know, innovation, you know, buzzwordy, whatever, but at least it's like they're, you know, in a space where they can focus on, you know, near-term, you know, future-term concepts and not interrupted by design execution, uh, deadlines. I mean, I just feel like, you know, if we think of our lives and we think about like when we're focused on the future, it's kind of mostly when we're not so bogged down by the present. Otherwise we're just dealing with putting out fires. And so it's really hard to have teams like being strategic and then have them executing at the same time. And so I feel like I don't like that this is how it is. You know, I wish we could say, okay, we're gonna turn off every, all the noise for 10 hours and focus on strategy simultaneously. Um, and you can set up sessions, you know, with Miro and Mural or whatever um, to keep people engaged. Um, and, and you know, knocking out whatever canvases, I think like it's a healthy environment to have in, in having these meetings that are weekly, just like you have your standups, like the strategy should be something that's constantly talked about. But if the company just can't buy into that, or even if they say that they are, but they're not doing it, then it's time to start pitching the other model, which is to have a team that's just focused on innovation and, saying, okay, I'm gonna hire the best people or we're gonna, people who are being the most innovative, I'm gonna pluck them and put them, you know, in my group and we're just going to, you know, be doing this and get buy-in from a stakeholder, secede. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, we have uh, some more questions, but uh, we don't have some, uh, we don't have time, so I'll Take let one me... more of the best questions. <laughs> uh, let me uh, share my screen. So you can throw your questions in LinkedIn. Please use the, the hashtags uh, UX and UX Greece. And uh, we're going to uh, or say hi or introduce yourself, ask a question to Jamie, ask anything about the UX field, uh, just say anything you want. And we're going to gather those questions and we're going to select two uh, lucky people uh, and we're going to send them uh, some books uh, wherever they are in the world. Uh, just do it today, uh, tonight, until uh, midnight uh, midnight in Greece. So just do your cal time calculations. Okay, it's about 
three and a half more hours. Uh, stay tuned uh, at the uh, UX Thessaloniki Meetup and Athens UX community for uh, meet upcoming meetups. Uh, we want to thank you all of you for being here, for all the, those great questions. G Jamie, thanks a lot for being here. We are expecting you uh, in Greece. Uh, it would be great to meet you in person. Uh, so let's uh, uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's be optimistic that uh, we will be uh, uh, run a meetup or anything but in person this time, uh, maybe this year. Uh, thanks again. Uh, good night to everyone, and uh, see you in uh, LinkedIn. Thank you, everybody, and thanks so much for having me. Bye bye. Thank you, Jamie.